What is good? All of our listeners and viewers, welcome to another episode of Games and Groceries. My name is Adam. And I'm Liz. And I forgot to buy Star Wars tickets early. That's right, folks. Today we are at episode 79, where we're going to be talking about narratives in movies and video games with our special guest, Sean Chandler. Woo! That's coming up a little bit later. So, as I said before... Uh, I forgot to buy the Star Wars tickets a little bit early because I didn't know we were or where we were moving to. Well, I think I'm kind of okay that the fact that you didn't. Yeah. Because I don't like being surrounded by people. It gives me anxiety. So we have two end seats. We have two end seats and it's at 830 at night. Yeah. So now I can sit on the outside and not worry about like who's sitting next to me and all that stuff. So. I'm okay with that, and at least it's not as bad as Endgame, where we were sitting in the very front row in the middle. Yeah. That was painful for my eyes. That was. <laughs> but, and uh, my neck. Well, we are in the very front row. No, we're in the second row. Mm-mm. I told you second row. That that wasn't available. Aww. Yeah. That wasn't available. We're in the front row in the corner. Darn. Yeah. So anyways, uh, we got a lot to talk about, and... Um, we did record our our interview with Sean Chan a little early, so uh, we're we're very excited to uh, have you here. What he's got to say. Uh, just a little side note. Uh, sorry about the audio hiccups in his interview. Uh, we got a new internet, and it was through a Skype call. So thanks, Xfinity. Thank you very much. Or for... maybe I'm just so good that it's seamless, and they didn't even notice, and you just pointed it out. Well, I mean, you know. If it does sound good, you go, you know, go tweet at Liz saying thank you very much. So, if it doesn't, I'm sorry. So uh, let's just get the show on the road. Uh, we have, you know, or some reminders to give you. So we just want to remind you that we are on social media at Gaming Groceries on Twitter, or you can follow us on Instagram, Games and Groceries, all one word. We can follow us there. Both of those will give you the opportunity to answer some questions for Midweek Speak, where I ask you certain gaming topics, and then you can uh, have your answers on the Wednesday uploads. And we also have a website, gamesandgroceries.com, where you can listen to all the episodes from the website, as well as find out where you can listen to the audio versions of the website all throughout the website. And if you haven't already, definitely hit that subscribe button and notification bell so that you know when all of these episodes come out and... If you're listening to us on the audio version, like iTunes or Spotify or wherever you leave reviews, definitely is some honest star ratings and reviews so that we can read them and feel good about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Also, it, it pushes us forward in the algorithm of iTunes. So uh, definitely, definitely do us a favor of uh, leaving us some iTunes reviews. So, all right. That all the way. Yeah. That's the business side. So let's get our show started with our first segment. Movie Minutes. Movie Minutes is a segment that we talk about the movies that we watched in the past week, whether it be on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, or even Disney Plus, or in theaters, and we like to recommend it, or we don't recommend it. But guess what? It's the holiday season! Holiday season, everybody. Uh, we are talking about holiday movies, Christmas movies, to be specific. Mm-hmm. And instead of rating it 1 to 10, it's a movie we like to rate it 1 to 10 jingles of how much Christmas spirit it gives us. 10 being Elf. 1 being The Matrix. <laughs> so, let's talk about it. Uh, this was recommended to us from our good friend, oh boy, our good friend, Dan, from the Greatest Story Ever Played podcast. He's in trouble. I already, I already DM'd him, and I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> so <laughs> he recommended we watch uh, A Christmas Prince on Netflix. He did tell you it was bad, though. He did warn me. He said, you want to know it's a really bad Christmas movie? <laughs> he did warn me, but let's let's get into it. So... Uh, Liz, opening thoughts. Um, well, Mm -hmm. I am in a place again where it wasn't really a Christmas movie. It, um, barely, it had like a scene on Christmas Day and a scene on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. It felt, by the end, it was like, that was more a New Year's Eve movie. Yeah, it really was. It was, Because um, the beauty part, the end... Happened on New Year's Eve. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it was just. So going through my notes here, I wrote, I wrote down notes as I watched the movie. And um, my very first note is that this movie is cheesier than the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, 
It's cheesier than any Hallmark film, any Lifetime movie. Oh, mm, let me take that back from Lifetime. Hallmark can be... No, Lifetime is good. Hallmark is cheesy. Yeah. Get your movie channels right. Whatever. I, I think it's the opposite. That's my opinion. Hallmark is much more cheesy. Yeah, than... Hallmark is really cheesy. Oh, wait, no, Lifetime. Lifetime. No. Lifetime is cheesy. Anyways, no. that's not the point. We're on a timer <laughs> this here. This is a fight for another time. <laughs> this is a fight for another day. <laughs> but it is a very cheesy, very love story, very standard... It's a very standard cheesy movie where, like, oh no, I have to work during Christmas Day. How can this happen? And but I'm really, single. The actual job wasn't on Christmas Day. She was yeah. there for like a week. Yeah, she's like, I'm going to have to be at the job on Christmas Eve. Also, I need a man. And it was just, and it, and it had so many tropes in it. And yeah. It, it, it was just like, it was a very standard cliche film that we've seen over and over again, and I and you know I I don't think it's wrong for me to say that I expect a lot more from Netflix. Yeah, but you know? if you've seen their other Christmas movies, yeah, you wouldn't because I watched one last year and it was pretty much pre- as predictable. Actually, the the one I watched last year was much better. Yeah, than the one we watched tonight. I mean, that kind of goes into my second note of like, who wrote this film? Who wrote the script for this? I mean, not just not just the plot, not the plot, because the plot is very basic, but the writing is terrible yeah, too. It's a solid plot. It's just the the script. A uh, solid plot is it's a little solid. It's fine, um, but the writing is horrendous. Like yeah. there's there's one scene where um, so so the basic premise is that uh, this journalist goes over to England or actually Estonia. Now, Aldovia. Aldovia. And she has to report on this prince, right? Oh, the Christmas prince. Blah, blah, blah. And and so she goes over and she pretends to be a tutor to go into uh, the royal pa- palace. And she's tutoring the prince's little sister. And the, the little sister, whatever, the princess. And the princess is, you know, in a wheelchair, blah, blah, blah. And there's this one scene where... The the little sister, the the princess, is actually catching on to this woman's game. And she starts to say, like, oh, I thought you were from Minnesota. Like, well, I actually went to school in New York. And she started to, like, really unravel the mystery. And then in the middle of this, right in the middle of this, like, whole unraveling, she's like, I bet you wonder why I'm like this in the wheelchair. I'm like, Yeah, what? I was like... Where did that come from? We weren't talking about that. She wasn't staring. And then she goes like, oh, I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm like, you what didn't. Did... You literally weren't staring. You didn't say anything. You were talking about something completely different. The whole movie was it's just like, like they edited something out and forgot. And the whole flow of the movie and the, and there's no purpose to this movie. It, it The only purpose is to. And that's the other thing. Aldovia. Yeah, it's it's Britain. It's England. Well, yeah. They all have British accents. Like, why do you say Aldovia? Because they needed to make a place up. Aldovia. But the whole purpose of it is to make a royal British Christmas movie. Yeah. But it wasn't Christmas. Which brings me to my my final point is that overall, this is a 90-minute movie that feels like it's two, two and a half hours long. It drags because it's so pointless. It's not because that it drags because it's slow. It drags like, why are we here? I don't think I hated it as much as you did. I hated this movie. I was going to say, I don't feel like it dragged. I didn't think it was that bad. I mean, it was cheesy, but it was still a cute movie. Dan, from the Greatest Story Ever Played podcast, I don't know your last name, but I will find you. And I will DM you more hate towards you. (laughs) Jeez. But. It really wasn't a Christmas movie. Like, it's a 90 yeah. movie movie. It, it, beyond that point that it just dragged for me personally, mm-hmm. it had no purpose. But it wasn't really a Christmas movie. No, not really. In fact, really. We, we reviewed The Last Christmas. That was more Christmassy. I was about to say, this is worse than The Last Christmas. And we gave that four jingles. Yeah. Because it, it, that had nothing to do with Christmas. But this one was just like... It was as much of a Christmas movie as a Harry Potter film. Yeah. It had Christmas in a scene. Yeah. So, Actually, Harry Potter has more Christmas in it than this movie. Yeah. I feel more Christmas with Harry Potter than this movie itself. So let's let's go really to our... I watch Elf after this. <laughs> I know. So 
let's actually let's have that be our last movie that we review for the holidays. Can we still watch it before that? I mean, yeah, but okay, good. anyways, <laughs> but final ratings. How many jingles do you give it? One being the Matrix. Two. A two. Whoa. Wow. Okay. There was no Christmas in it. Yeah. There was nothing. Like so I said Harry Potter is more Christmassy than this movie. Yeah, true. So, yeah, they get a two because they had it in a whole one scene. You know, two it, if you count Christmas Eve. You know, now, now I think about it, I'll also give it a two. You were going to give it a three, right? I was going to give it a three just because, you know, it, it did have Christmas throughout the movie. Yeah, they mentioned it. They mentioned it, but it doesn't really, it, it's not really... Uh, a main plot point. Not like no. Elf. Elf was the plot point. Like that, that was, was the turning point. Well, it's Christmas. The whole theme of it was Christmas. This was just like the house was decorated for Christmas. Yeah. And there was a Christmas ball and like, oh, oh hail the Christmas prince. Yes, they do say that. Well, they that's say, because their tradition is that coronation is on Christmas Eve at the at the Christmas Eve ball. That's why. Oh hail the Christmas prince. There's, anyway. So those are our thoughts about A Christmas Prince on Netflix. Yeah. Dan, from The Greatest Story I Ever Played, is in big trouble with me. <laughs> We're no longer friends. And, guys, there's two more movies after it. There's The Christmas Prince, The Royal Wedding, and then there's The <sighs> Christmas Prince, The Royal Baby. Kill me. I told Adam we should watch them. I want to die. Actually, I'm almost tempted to watch them just to see if they, like, get any Christmas or oh <laughs> any more Christmassy. <laughs> You have to let me know because I, 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 I I'd rather stick I'll a fork in my eye. After Christmas, I'm not wasting my Christmas movie watching time on that on those movies. So before we talk anymore, that was also a Christmas Prince. It's on Netflix. I don't recommend it. You do. I recommend it just because it's a cute movie. If I remind you of anything of yourself, if you look at me and you see a reflection anyway, don't watch this movie. If, if you I really more to Liz, me, yeah. You can watch it and not hate it as much as Adam. I really hate this movie. You can thoroughly enjoy the movie. This is a nightmare come true. Anyway. <laughs> so, with all that being said, that was Movie Minutes, but let's jump into our second segment. Top 3 Gaming News. The Top 3 Gaming News is the gaming news that we saw in the past week, and we'd like to rank it 3, 2, 1, just to give you a condensed version of what's going on in the games industry so that you're up to date with the games industry. So... Uh, like I said, we do rank this three, two, one with what we think is, you know, in our top three. And let's start with our number three gaming news, and that is PlayStation. Yes, the brand of PlayStation actually celebrates the Guinness Book of World Record as the best-selling home console mm -hmm. ever brand. It's not Nintendo. It's PlayStation. And yep. that's not surprising for a couple reasons. No. Um, so so going into my notes here, surprisingly enough, like I said, Nintendo's not a part of it. And I say surprisingly, but if we really look at home console sales for Nintendo, they're not fantastic. In fact, their handheld consoles are the ones that sell the most, which is why when you think about, you know, the Nintendo Switch, why is that selling so high? Yeah. It's hybrid. Yeah. But... And, you know, the Switch Lite is also selling pretty high. But uh, it wasn't Nintendo. It was actually, if you read Console Wars, it's actually the company that, you know, was kind of screwed by Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Like PlayStation, Sony, they were screwed by Nintendo. In fact, you know, like they took a lot of credit for what Sony had provided for them. And uh, Sony went out of their way saying, like, listen, if you're going to do this to us, we're gonna make our own play. Uh, we're gonna make our own game console, and look at that. It's uh, twenty five years later. Yep. And they just like bloom out of the water. Yep. Now, I'm gonna read this quote right here from the article. All the articles are linked down below, whether you're listening on audio or on YouTube. Uh, but the quote says on Twitter, the official PlayStation count uh, revealed that between the original system, PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3 the, and the PlayStation 4, the brand has sold more than 450 million units. Woof! My goodness. We know that the PS4 alone has managed to sell over 100 million units during its lifetime and the PlayStation 2 has sold over or has sold over 150 million units. And the first system has sold 100 million. And of course, you know, PlayStation 3, 80 million. That was, for a number of different reasons, did not do so well. One being that it launched at $600 in 2006. Yeah. That was a nightmare. 
six hundred dollars. But that's why that was the lowest. But still, eighty million is nothing to you know. Yeah. You know, snuff about. But I think this is well deserved. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, you know, PlayStation is high. Uh, like they're they're riding pretty high right now. And in terms of next gen, it's mm-hmm. really their race to lose. Yeah. You know. Yeah, they. Um, I just have to say, yay PlayStation. Good, good quote. Yeah. Great quote. <laughs> but that's just it. Is that like, I, I, I really do think that the PlayStation Five will have you know just as many sales because I, I, I think from what they're talking about, what the system is capable of, what the controller is capable of. Yeah. They're advanced. Yeah. And they're better. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Better. Except for when they make a controller bigger for my small hands. Jeez. I think I think they're going to do fine, especially yeah. since they got Insomniac. Yeah. I think that they're going to ride pretty high in the next generation. They're doing fine. We yeah. don't need to worry about them. So let's go on to another um, next gen kind of uh, news here is that um, remember when... You know, Phil Spencer said, like, oh, no, the Lockhart. It's not real, guys. Don't worry about that. Well, guess what? Jason Schreier says, you liar. Because Jason Schreier says um, he wrote an article. Really good article, by the way. Um, not as good as the Anthem article. That was that was really well written. Like, my goodness. But Microsoft is still planning a cheaper, diskless, next-gen Xbox, according to Jason Schreier. And... You know, uh, say what you want about the guy. You know, uh, call him an SGW, whatever, like, abbreviation you want to call this guy. I don't really care. The dude knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. The dude really um, puts in the good work and the deep thinking. And uh, But, yeah, Project Scarlet, if if you ever hear the word Project Scarlet, it's actually the umbrella of these two consoles that Microsoft is planning to do. Uh, one being a more powerful system mm-hmm. known as Project Anaconda or Xbox Anaconda. And then you have this smaller system that's supposed to be just, you know, your basic system, your Xbox One S equivalent uh, known as Project Lockhart. Mm-hmm. But Phil Spencer said, nope, it's not really a thing. It's not actually a thing. Don't worry about that. Project Scarlet is Anaconda. Don't worry about that. But not only did Jason Schreier find four sources four serious sources about Lockhart being a thing. Mm-hmm. He also has the specs in mind. Now, I want to read this quote from Jason Schreier. Uh, it says, Lockhart will also likely be heavily promoted with Microsoft's be, uh, burgeoning, burgeoning. Oh, good job, Adam. You can't even read that word. I have no idea what that word is. You graduate college, Adam. Good job. Uh, but with Microsoft's xCloud streaming service, an impressive xbox game pass subscription so lockhart's going to be mainly focused on the x cloud and game pass which is you know, makes sense uh which allows users to access a huge library of games both big and small including all the first uh all the new first party games both of those services fit nicely with a discless console and microsoft has already packaged xbox game pass with a digital only version of the xbox one s known as you know the sad edition xbox one s all digital Say it, uh, which launched earlier this year. He also quotes the specs to say that uh, Lockhart is going to be around 1440p, not true 4K. But you know, if you're if it's just going to be X Cloud and you know doing Xbox Game Pass, which mm-hmm. is you know older games too, I think 1440p is just fine. Yeah, at 60 frames a second. Yeah, that's just fine. And this could also be due to the amount of sales mm-hmm. that the Sad Edition actually made in the UK. Yeah. Like, it actually sold really well. That's good. Are you tired? No, I just, I don't know. I don't have much to comment <laughs> on it. Um, usually you don't comment this much because you're, like, tired. No. Which I am. I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, but that, that's the thing. I, I'm i actually pretty happy that this is alive and well because if they do come out in E3, like, Phil Spencer comes yeah. out with his cool leather jacket and his graphic oh, t-shirt... And his nice hair that I wish I had the genetics for. Aww. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, Adam, why do you shave your head? Uh, genetics. But. He has nice hair. I ha- Oh, Phil Spencer? No, you do. I had it. You have nice hair. Thank you. You're welcome. But anyways, uh, if they come out 
and with his nice hair. And he says that we have two consoles, one more powerful. Oh, but look at this. $200 off, you get a totally fine service with Xbox Game Pass. So let's say that the Xbox Scarlet, I mean, Anaconda is $500. $300, you get this discless and less powerful system. But, you know, all you, all you need to have is Xbox Game Pass and then you're good to go. I'm just curious if that would be like a good financial decision. Like that's a lot of money to create two consoles and release mm-hmm. them at the same time. I don't like, I, I'm assuming they would have done research and stuff. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, uh, it, as an outsider, it feels like that's a waste of money for them. I'm trying to look up a quote here. Here we go. Uh, that Xbox. Yeah. Uh, so Phil Spencer once said that like the business isn't how many consoles you sell and I'm trying to find, yeah, the business isn't how many consoles you sell. It's, it's more of the platform that they're trying to sell. Uh, I don't need to sell any specific version of the console in order for us to reach our business goals. They always take a loss in console sales. They want you to get on the platform to get on game pass so that they make money off of that. Yes, I understand. It doesn't matter how many they're selling, but I mean, right. is it a waste of money to produce them? I don't think it's a waste of money in the long run. It's the, it, you have to t- you have to think about the long run of yeah. the business. Um, they're taking a big loss with these consoles. Yeah, massive losses, and that's just it that you have to think about. Is that yes, like it is a waste of money in a short game. Yeah. But when you talk about, you know, getting people just getting them on the platform. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't matter how you get them there. It's just get them there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just, yeah. But like, like I said, it's an outsider's perspective. I know they know what they're doing. It's just. Yeah. In my opinion. So let me quickly go into our number one gaming news because, you know, I want you to, you know, get to Sean Chandler's interview, which was, you know, quite excellent, by the way. Quite excellent. Quite excellent. <laughs> Star Citizen. A game that's been in development for eight years, eight, yep. has now raised $250 million in crowdfunding. You know what I could do with $250 million? <laughs> well, I'm about to get into that, actually. What I would do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Forget the news. We're just going to tell you what we could do with that money. And it's still not releasing anytime soon. So. Yeah. Star Citizen is a space simulation game that's been, you know, around for a good while, eight years, and mm-hmm. it still hasn't released, but it, it's been crowdfunded. Like, anytime they need some money, you know, they have a Kickstarter, you know, they they do what they have to, to, you know, get their uh, lines in order, you know. Um, just reading this quote right here, Cloud Imperium Games, which is the people who are making... Um, uh, what is it? Star, Star Citizen. Citizen. <laughs> a hugely ambitious game has been in development for almost eight years and it will remain unfinished. It remains unfinished. However, that extended period has left plenty of room for the company to bring in more funding from the community. Yeah, the they're p- nowhere near done. It remains unfinished. What have they been doing for eight years? Eight years. Getting more money. And that's just it. In November, this past November 2019... Uh, their crowdfunding actually was funded $9 million in a month. So what'd they do then? It's just, it, it's... There are people who have made games on less. And that's just it. That's, that's my final note for this, is in this news piece, is that, okay, you're, you're probably asking, like, well, $250 million is, you know, how much money does that give you? Let me put this in perspective. Grand Theft Auto V... Rockstar Games for Grand Theft Auto V, they used two hundred and sixty-five million dollars. Star Citizen has two hundred fifty million. Grand Theft Auto has two hundred sixty-five million, not just for developing the game, but also marketing the game. Mm-hmm. That was for development and marketing the yeah. game. Star Citizen is at triple A level right now. Yeah, with two hundred fifty million, and it's exceeded by the time we've covered this in fact um why don't you talk a little bit more and then i want to find out the real number as we're recording this yeah like i don't know i just there's people who've made games for so much less who make these games in like the corner of their living room yeah for 
so much less money and people have been giving them money for eight years and they haven't had the decency to try and release as much as they can do anything give anything no they have 250 million dollars or more right now and it's yeah i don't know it's just it just boggles my mind that they're just like it's not ready yet here we go. Okay, so All I right. found. Let's see. Where are they at? Uh, two hundred fifty-three million eight hundred seventy-two thousand three hundred and five dollars. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. But that's just it. And it's they're a, like it's not ready yet. I don't know. Like it's just it feels like. Why aren't you done yet? Like why aren't they anywhere near done? Like they're not even at a point where they can show us. A trailer. I mean, they have. Like, like, they've shown, like, little bits here and there, but, like, nothing to, like, sneeze about. And these are the stretch goals right here. And I'm, like, scrolling and scrolling just to see. Make me dizzy. Yeah. Accomplish, you know. Uh, they they have they a PvP. They accomplished over a million dollars back in 2014. Jeez. Like, I don't know. Oh, you have pets now. That's cool. They don't have any more stretch goals beyond $65 million. Enhanced uh, ship mod, um, modularity. They don't have anything past $65 million. Why aren't so you that done? Should be, that's all they need. Because if that's the, pe- that's the last stretch goal, that means that that was what they were aiming for originally. Yeah. So what's going on $250 million later? Yeah, 2012 to 2019. My goodness. Insane. But yeah. That's all I have to say about that. It's just like, why aren't you done yet? Yeah. It just, if I had $250 million to develop the best podcast to ever be in existence, you bet your sweet patootie that (laughs) I would beat Joe Rogan in a, you know, in a day with that kind of money. Yeah. But anyways, you know, that's all I have to say. Uh, Even with, you know, $250,000, you know what I could do for this podcast with that money yeah well whatever so again that's all we have to say uh let's just jump into our final segment or you know our next segment with sean chandler again um you know i i hope you enjoy our conversation with him i hope you enjoy every oh computer shut up anyways i hope you enjoy our conversation with the man um you know, really inspirational interview that we that we got to know him a little bit better. And then we talked about narratives in movies and video games. So um, without any further ado, let's just jump right into it. Uh, we hope you enjoy this next segment um, with our special guest, Sean Chandler. The Sean Chandler. Oh, yeah. The Sean Chandler. And you'll get that joke later. The Sean Chandler. It's interview time. All right, buddy. Welcome back. We are here with our special guest, uh, Sean Chandler. But I'm not going to introduce him. I'm going to let himself introduce himself. So uh, take it away. How how can we help you? What? <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Sean Chandler. I have a YouTube channel called Sean Chandler Talks About where uh, it's just basically a place for people that like to talk about movies way too much that they drive the people around them crazy. Just rambling about that new Black Widow trailer that dropped today. If oh, you're that nice. kind of person... That's what my channel exists to be. Kind of have a positive environment. Try to try and filter out as much of kind of the toxic fandom and just the meanness. And have a channel that's yeah. not trying to hate on movies, but love movies. Like, celebrate them. So that's what it's all about. That's what I do. Yeah, we very much appreciate your channel. In fact, um, we've been following it uh, not since the very beginning, but uh, that that's what we uh, got attracted to about your channel. It's very positive attitude. It's not um, kind of giving a negative vibe about movies. It's just being really excited about movies, and that's really right, refreshing. Exactly. Yeah. That youthful giddiness that like, yeah. you just ex- that these things exist, and even bad ones. It's like, hey, people worked hard on that. Didn't work for me, but. Why would I take that as a reason to pick on someone's work? Like what? I'm just not interested in that. Yeah. So try to have a positive energy about me. It's like I actually get kind of confused sometimes when some of my peers that talk about movies and it seems like they hate yeah. 75% of movies that come out <laughs> and like what? Why do you do this? Yeah. Like, I just love movies. So that's, you know, I can go see Playing With Fire with John Cena. I'm not the target audience, but yeah. I got kids. So I can have fun watching mm-hmm. not a great movie, but it's still a movie. Yeah. That's what we like. And yeah. uh, 
If you're looking for a one sentence description of Sean Chandler, it is the polar opposite of cinema sins. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> yep. Kind of intentionally. That's like people ask me, oh, do you watch cinema sins? Like, no, that doesn't really interest me. That's like, yeah. The, totally wrong way to think about movies and i don't that's not disrespect for them if people enjoy that yeah. that's your thing but i just don't even think about movies in the, that regard like there's nothing enjoyable about that uh sort of thing where it's just like let's just let's just tear movies to pieces like uh, why yeah <laughs> yeah so if our audience doesn't know you already uh we we want to take this time to uh just to get to know you a little bit better, just to have our audience really get to know the depth of you, uh, because we're going to get a little deep in these questions, but we want to start with a fun one. Um, Being from Philly ourselves, and yeah, Mm -hmm. we grew up in uh, Northeast Philly, so shout out to Northeast High School. What's up? (laughs) Oh my goodness. Um, (laughs) You say that uh, Sylvester Stallone is your favorite actor, correct? Yeah, I I actually hate picking favorites, but it's certain ones where it's like, okay, this seems to be fall in line. If someone's going to be the favorite, very clearly, he's the guy that comes out on top based off favorites and all that fun stuff. I like that decision right there, but uh, because you've been very adamant about it. Uh, Every time someone asks you who's your favorite actor, every single time you will say Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, it's it's, it's a wife pick, actually. It's not one that I'm not very good at. I just don't really think that way. I don't – I like variety and diversity in different people and there's different things people like like for different reasons. Yeah. And then my wife was like, I mean he's your favorite. I mean how, how could you even think it's anyone else? I was like, I guess that's true. It's like sometimes you need someone yeah. else to hold up that mirror. And as soon as she said it, I was like, OK, I got to stop. I can actually commit to something. I don't have to be all <laughs> uh, fluid on everything. Like you're, she's right. And so then that's that's why that's one of the few things where I can give a definitive answer. But some of that's it's just because of the nature of the channel. There's these questions that people ask all the time. And it's like, man, I have to force myself into that corner that I don't necessarily want to put myself into. But Mm -hmm. uh, certain ones where it's like, yeah, I mean, that those those, I go back to his stuff and just respect so much of his stuff. And um, whenever we got married. uh, Two days after our, our wedding, we were in the theater watching Rocky Balboa. I'm pretty sure that's okay. the thing. We're on our honeymoon. I was like, well, I don't know what other people do on their honeymoons. We're going to go see the new Rocky movie. Yeah. That probably mm-hmm. set the stage for her understanding of me and him as my favorite actor. Dang. Well, if he is your favorite actor, and for, yeah. for me, uh, it's Tom Cruise. So I have a lot of uh, answers for this question. If it were yeah, He would be way up there for me, too. I mean, yeah. Fantastic entertainer. And oh, when he yeah. chooses to, fantastic actor, too. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, personal uh, personal agendas aside, you know, he's a fantastic actor. Um, but I want to ask you, since he is your favorite actor and you've seen a lot of his movies, what would you say is the most or one of the most underrated movies, as in not a lot of people talk about, not a lot of people know about? What do you think is the most underrated Stallone film? So one that's uh, very relevant for right now okay. would be uh, Copland. Directed by oh, James Mangold, yeah. who just came out with uh, uh, Ford vs. Ferrari, mm-hmm. which is getting all sorts of Oscar buzz, fantastic film. And then he, of course, did Logan a couple years back. Mm-hmm. But so back 20 years ago, he does Copland. And at the time, nobody knows who James Mangold is. And so it's just kind of like this cop thriller with yeah. Stallone in it. And it was Stallone trying to like remind people that he's a great actor. Yeah. And so then he put on 40 pounds of fat for the movie. And so it's like he's known for body transformations. This was the one that was in the opposite direction Mm -hmm. from what he's normally known for. And he's not the hero cop. He's a loser cop that's never done anything. And he's in this he's in this. Have you seen it? No, I didn't. I really wanted to and I missed it. Yeah. So it's basically he's the the sheriff of this small itty bitty little Jersey town next to New York City where all the NYC cops live in this town. So he's the cop of the cops. And then some things start to show up that maybe it's not as good as he thinks it is. Mm -hmm. And that's where kind of the movie unfolds. And that's that's just like the setup of it. But it's very cool little uh, crime thriller with Stallone playing against type, really acting inside of it. And then you've got James Mangold kind of telling one of these complex narratives. Um, And I mean, it's got Robert De Niro in it, um, uh, Harvey Keitel, Ray Liotta. Um, So I mean, just stacked cast, even more. uh, Janine Garofalo is in it. And so um, that's one of those ones that uh, is not like super obscure, 
Um, but at the same time, it's one that people don't talk about nearly as much because it, it, all the, you know, uh, it's not as quotable as something like Demolition Man, of course, there's iconic ones in Rocky and Rambo. Mm-hmm. So those ones that can or uh, can go under the radar a little bit is uh, I would say is that one. OK, mm-hmm. I like that choice. That's definitely going to go on my list right now uh, for our channel, uh, for our podcast. We're doing uh, Christmas movies right now, like all week we're doing uh, all, all these different Christmas movies, uh, whether it be good or bad. Uh, I think for this one, we're doing uh, A Christmas Prince on Netflix because I heard it was the worst Christmas movie. Yeah. So I've got to see it. But <laughs> I think I'm going to end up liking it. <laughs> <laughs> but Copland is definitely going to be on our list. Um, yeah. But speaking on that, you definitely are a movie YouTuber and you've found success with that. And uh, Liz, would you like to bring us to our second question? Sure. So how would you say that YouTube success has affected the relationship you have with your wife and children, both the positives and the negatives? So it's a little bit tough to um, answer that one without understanding kind of the full context of my life, which is to say before I was doing this, I was a youth pastor for eight years and then that ended um, because of personal issues on my part. Mm -hmm. And then I was a truck driver for a paint company Yeah, transitionally. And then parallel to that, I started my YouTube channel. And so at the point in time, prior entirely to YouTube, when I was in youth pastor mode, I was just kind of such a big wreck myself. I just had so many personal issues that I needed to work through. I was not a a good uh, husband, father, any of the different things. I, I just had in a very bad place. And so the contrast isn't really, it's, it's tough to like, just say that it's how has YouTube made the change? Cause yeah. so many things changed in a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. So if I were to just tighten it down to the YouTube aspect to it, and I really kind of talk about it from this, the year 2019, which where I've been able to go full time with YouTube. Uh, the, the incredible thing for me is just, it, it means that I'm, around. Yeah. And I think that uh, quality time is an accident that happens with quantity time. You can't mm. schedule quality time. You never know when that's going to happen. It happens when you're around someone a lot and you're intentional about being around them a lot. And that's when magic happens, those special moments. And because I work from home, my wife works from home yeah. every day. I go pick up my kids from school um, you know, all day, kind of work in there with my wife. And if we want to go do something exciting today, we can do something exciting. It just means I get to be there, uh, be present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, even built into the YouTube thing is is that I I get to take like my kids to the movies and have kind of some pretty cool little experiences Mm -hmm. with all of that. But I mean, the big positive and plus is I'm just there. Mm -hmm. And likewise, in comparison to past church world life, yeah, I I, I was just so stressed out Mm -hmm. and emotionally empty for years straight for about five years straight, I was running on empty yeah. and that's unhealthy. <laughs> that's not a good thing. And I mean, some of that's, I think the inherent nature of church world in the 21st century with technology, it's, there's mm-hmm. just, that's really tricky when everyone has access to all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of it's, I'm an introvert mm-hmm. and I'm not naturally pastoral. Yeah. And so then being in that space where I, you have to carry everyone's burdens and everyone wants to come with to you and they're supposed to. I didn't have a particularly deep emotional reservoir. So because of that, I'm cut. I came home every day, just empty, mm-hmm. drained, cranky, because I just had to be pastor guy. And, and now with YouTube, I just kind of, uh, I don't carry that weight on my shoulders and it, it lines up much more with the way that I'm wired and I'm still plugged in at my church. I'm actually still working with the teenagers there, Yeah, but it, it's, it's, mm-hmm. um, a much more when I'm home, I can be me with my family. That's the positive, the negative. Um, I, I think there's with my wife, it's almost cause we both work from home. So we're all around each other at the time. <laughs> so, so, so there's, there's a kind of a problem in that of you can take it for granted that you're, mm. Mm-hmm. Just because we're sitting in the same room, we're both on our laptops. We both kind of do social media for a living. And so we're there, but it's mm-hmm. not intentional there. So you just have to be, think about stuff like that. And with my kids, I, it's more long term. I, I fear the ramifications of if, when, however that plays out that, you know, to whatever degree I'm famous yeah. or whatever that looks like, that can have trickled down on them. 
mm-hmm. and I'm not crazy about that, as well as every kid under the age of 18 right now has the delusion that they're going to be YouTube famous mm-hmm. and make a ton of money. And um, I, my life then can feed that delusion for my own kids. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, you guys don't realize the – <laughs> the journey that got me there. It's not, mm-hmm. it wasn't just, it didn't just happen. Yeah. Uh, it was a years and years and years of skills that I built that led up to being successful. Anyway, that's a very long answer to your question. No, no, well, it's, no, uh, it's good, yeah. we, we always like a uh, long winded uh, answers, not to say you're long winded. <laughs> oh, I am. You can that. say I am. Cause I know. Yeah. I am long winded. <laughs> that's what we're looking for. We're looking for your, anytime we have a guest on here, we want to get, their perspective, their um, their whole life. And just like you described, you have a unique life where if I asked that to another YouTuber, we had Mr. Matty plays on, uh, his answer would be completely different mm-hmm. because he doesn't have the same life as you. Uh, but you mentioned church life. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're, we're going to take this uh, stab in the air and say uh, you're a Christian. Yes, say, you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we've had some discussions like off camera about church world and how it stresses us out. Uh, but back to like kind of a fun one, kind of like a, a sugar spike in this whole uh, interview section. Uh, we've talked on the podcast here about how Christian video games can and can't work. Uh, we've had two separate episodes all about that. But since you're a movie buff and also a Christian and also a former youth pastor, I want to hear your opinion. How can Christian movies work and how they can't work. What's your opinion? Well, well, before we move off of Christian video games, have you spoken about Noah's Ark 3D for the Super Nintendo on the podcast? No, before? and I no. no, and I have played that before. Do you know what it is? Yeah, I totally know. That, that they uh, they took the code for uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, I don't uh, think you know. I've never it heard of it. Yeah. I'm it. <laughs> the craziest, no, that... like, wait, a Christian video game stole the code from yeah from uh, Castlevania game about killing Nazis and just <laughs> oh my god, Wolfenstein at Castlevania. Yeah, yeah, we're we're recording this kind of uh, late to our end, but yeah, like it, it's kind of crazy about that, and, and even there's other uh, Christian video games that kind of. Uh, you know, they, they took kind of um, inspiration or even the code from other games and tried to make it Christian. And that's the, the way it can't work. It can't be one of those yeah. like yeah. spinoff ideas. It has to be its own unique. And it, mm-hmm. if anybody wants to watch, um, you know, link up here uh, if you want to see it. But uh, I want to get your opinion about Christian movies, uh, how they yeah. can work, but how they can't work as well. Yeah, I, I, I um. People ask me frequently, hey, why don't you re- review more Christian movies? You're a Christian. Why don't you go see all the Christian movies? Why don't you support them? I was like, mm-hmm. I, most of them don't really appeal to me Yeah, for the same reason that a lot a lot of Hollywood movies don't um, appeal to me. Now, I mean, obviously a ton of them do, but certain ones are – I'll put it, any movie that just feels like it's trying to – preach its message rather than mm-hmm. tell a story that communicates the message yeah. is instantly kind of off-putting to me. Mm-hmm. And whether that's a belief that I believe in a Christian movie, I'd probably agree with most of the things they're saying. Sure. But when you're watching this very heavy handed drama where it's, it's basically a sermon illustration as a mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. and it's yeah. literally like, all right, what's, who's the guy with the family drama going on in our church yeah. And you have the guy that's got this struggle and he's he's there, but he's not really there. And then you just show that. And what's the truth he needs to learn? And so 75 percent of the way through the movie, he, that little sermon bullet point, big idea is communicated mm-hmm. to him. And then he's changed for the last like you just watch it. It's like ah, like and people always would when I was in church will come. Oh, it's so good. It's got a great message. And it's like. Right, because it's a sermon illustration. It's yeah. a sermon that I preached, and they just took a sermon and then just wrote a script around it. Yeah, and that just doesn't interest me. And it, like I said, that applies also to when I watch certain movies. Uh, to go in a very non-Christian direction, movie came out last year called called Blockers. I remember you talking about, about that. Yeah, uh, about um, uh, prom night, and then these parents find out that their kids are going to go out and do what teenagers often do prom night and mm-hmm. so they decide to try and block their um kids from doing that mm-hmm. and I, inherently any movies about teenagers at parties misbehaving doesn't naturally appeal to me yeah. but the thing that was most off-putting about the film is there was multiple scenes in it where it pauses and someone is like basically preaching at the camera yeah and mm. you just see the the like the writer's agenda and i was like this is 
why this movie is off-putting. It's not even just I disagree with your morality, which is incredible dangerous what you're teaching inside of this right. but you're actually like having someone preach at the camera mm -hmm. and it's the same thing as to why like I don't want a movie to sit, do that that I agree with and I don't want that does that that I, that I disagree with like, yeah. just the story should tell your message mm -hmm. so uh, two years ago Case for Christ came out mm -hmm. which it, it's, it's just a terrible title for that actual movie Yeah, because uh, the, the book The Case for Christ is Lee Strobel the journalist doing all this research and presenting the case for Christ after mm -hmm. interviewing all these people. The movie is the Lee Strobel story. It's yeah. about him and his marriage problems. And then this, it was like the process while he was doing the investigations that kind of led, but it's his story. It communicates it through an actual person's journey, mm -hmm. researching something, processing through things. And I was like, yeah, this is just a really good, uh, interesting movie about a person, an actual person. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he, he was a Christian and therefore there's Christian elements inside of it. And then there's parts where he's doing research. And so it communicates some of that kind of deeper data that's in the book. Mm -hmm. But, um, that's why it worked for me is that it wasn't, um, you know, someone goes somewhere and then it lectures you for 10 minutes about um, uh, the evidence and who the writings of Josephus. It, yeah. it didn't do that. It was about this guy and what actually changed for him. Mm -hmm. It was a narrative. It was yeah. uh, it, it was a narrative of a person's life rather than somebody being meta, breaking the fourth wall and just preaching at you. Yeah. I, yeah. That, that's kind of what we said about video games, too, is that. If it tries to preach at you, if it just tries to be a Christian video game, if that's your goal, I want to make a Christian video game, that's where it's going to fail. Uh, I, I think the best kind of Christian video game could be a game without kind of dialogue, but instead um, it is messaged with themes about Christianity that you need to kind of figure out from your own. And, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of uh, went into that uh, a little bit on the whole episode, but... Uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. But. Or you take Call of Duty, okay. replace the graphics with Noah's Ark. Oh, Noah's and instead Ark. of having a machine gun, you're shooting like Rainbows. food at animals. Oh, food at oh, animals. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. I like that. I, yeah, yeah. I could get somebody in. Uh, a little side note, even, even talking about Noah, when I worked at a uh, cheesesteak place in Philadelphia, and uh, you know, I was doing street ministry at the time, but one of the chefs, you know, uh, he wasn't Christian. He's like, you know what, Adam? And he knew I was a Christian. He's like, I think my favorite uh, Bible character is Noah. I was like, no way. And, and I was like, let's talk about that. He's like, yeah, you know, I really just appreciate him. And he, he went all the whole arc and like, and how he had to sacrifice his family and even his daughter. I was like, wait, 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 wait. Are you talking about the movie? He's like, yeah, I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> and so it's like, did they really have to kill themselves? Like, Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, during our break, we're going to have that little, little talk, but the book is better. But yes, <laughs> going with that. Um, but we, we've also, uh, we have also uh, heard uh, on your channel about your struggles, and that brings into mm -hmm. our, our next question. Yeah. So you've been open about your struggles with alcoholism, both on and off your channel, including an interview you did with life radio 88.5 in 2016. That's a deep cut right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I had yeah. to do some heavy research and I found that I was like, Whoa. Okay. Like I, I loved what you said on that, but mm -hmm. that, that was, that was legit like a month after everything went down. I mean, that was wow. kind of almost freaked the way it all played out that I just randomly submitted, uh, a blog post I'd written to relevant magazine mm -hmm. and then they printed it. And the way they Whoa. do that, they don't tell you that they printed it. So I just was like scrolling through relevant and then saw my name wow. and this like very open confession. And then the person emailed me based off of that, uh, relevant publishing this thing piece that I wrote. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry. I cut you off. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do you think that it's vital to share your struggles openly rather than hiding them away in the figurative closet? Well, so there's a lot of different uh, angles to, to answer that specific question in light of my specific situation. Mm -hmm. So the most uh, upfront reason for me is that what fed my struggles with alcoholism was that it, the hiding of it. That's mm -hmm. always what the problem was yeah. um, because it was drinking to an amount that any reasonable person would be like, that's not – you don't have a problem. But they might say, given your family history, that's probably not wise. And I always yeah. knew that mm -hmm. um, early stage. But it was like, 
oh, I want to keep this a secret. I don't want people to know that I drink at all. And so then it was something that no one was really had any awareness of it. Mm-hmm. And so the secretive nature of it is what caused it to grow. The you know, sins grow in secret. That was actually something I said inside of the, the article I wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, but so then when I kind of had that moment of like, I just need to kind of go scorched earth on my life right now and get help. Um, and I mean, it was all, it was very much one day I'm hero pastor guy at my church. And then the next day, everyone's like, what just happened? Like he's got like gone. I mean, it was yeah. that incredibly quick mm-hmm. and the worst week of the year for it to happen. And it was cause that's what needed to happen for me that I just did. It wasn't about rep- saving my reputation. It was about what's the right thing to do. And that rightness was openness. And, um, you know, says in James four that, you know, God opposes the, the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Mm-hmm. It's that entire concept of humility, uh, says, I'm going to put it all out there, the truth and see what happens. And pride says, I need to protect my reputation. I'll be the one in control of what people know about me. Mm-hmm. And, um, so just at the core of everything that was part of my healing process was, I just, uh, was openness, Put it out there. So yeah. that's, that's the kind of the at the core of it on a personal level. That's what it was on the as a social media level of just my thoughts on what the right way to do social media is. That's healthy for me and creates a healthy culture for other people is uh, I, I firmly believe that that's having a certain level of realness to who you are. Um, yeah, it's both like my, my channel. I don't. That the the person you see on Sean Chandler talks about that is a that's my stage persona. Mm-hmm. I am much more introverted. I, I have that same persona if I'm speaking live, or if I'm running an event, or if I'm on YouTube. Yeah. I'm very kind of dynamic, loud, arms moving. If you see me in a crowded room, I'm probably not talking and have like a very straight face because yeah. uh, I'm introverted and shy. And so that there is a persona side to it, but it's it's just a it's still a part of who I am. I'm not playing a character. It's just the my stage persona. It's 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 true to to me. But like I I want people to really connect with a real person and understand that there, there's the persona isn't all that there is. There's a person behind all of it, mm-hmm. and um, that's helpful for people to to know that I have struggles, I have insecurities. And, uh, I don't have it all together. Um, and even, you know, some of the stuff that I do in the process of trying to have, you know, content, you know, sometimes letting people in behind the, the, the curtain to see like, here's what's really going on. Like I, you're seeing a slick produced thing. Cause that's, what's the best product for you to consume. Right. But Hey, just so you know, here's what's, this is the real side to it. I, I, I don't want the facade to be all that you think that there is. And I think there's a side to it also of, I know how lonely I was in my struggles, Mm-hmm. And simply knowing someone else out there that I respect had the same struggles would have been very helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I think putting that out there is incredibly important. And I, I, it's just a lot of combination of I think it's very healthy to put things out there. I want the facade to come down, the persona to be put aside to like make sure you know here's the real Sean. Yeah. And it's like. Uh, I'm very grateful for the life that I have, but it was pretty brutal to get here. And some of the, I mean, that's not just my struggles, but you know, I grew up with an alcoholic dad that died when I was 20. Um, I didn't grow up thinking I was abused and became an adult and told some stories, was telling some people stories about dad stories when I was like, I called them dad stories because these bizarre stories of when he was drunk, what he, stuff he would do. And I was telling them to someone who was like 23, 24, 25. And I, just, I paused and I went, wait. If a student told me this story, I would think, oh, man, this kid's being abused. I need to call the cops. Yeah. And like, but I'm once saying the story. I had like that recollection. It's not that like I, I don't want to overstate that. Like there's people far worse. It was isolated incidents where certainly what my dad did moved into the category of abuse. It was isolated incidents, but it absolutely did happen. And that I think people knowing that is really important that um, that I, like I have that history. Everybody has history like that. And me sharing my struggles helps someone else to to find people, to find community, feel have the courage to share their stories. That that's what a big part of it for me. And just on the Christian side to it, uh, um, it's an opportunity for me to use the platform I have to even share the gospel in a way that is appropriate. Yeah, that it's not um, 
talking about, I don't know, I don't want to like sermonize a movie in force the gospel or allegorize films, but I think I've been doing this and earned the right to share my story. And I have a story that I think is helpful for people. And inside of that, the truth of my story is the gospel is at the center of it. It's not that I suddenly had a bunch of willpower to overcome my addictions. It was very gospel centric life transformation. And so then, you know, once a year, I'm just sharing my story about very real struggles that a percentage of my followers have. And they message me afterwards. I'm like, hey, I'm so glad you shared that. I, that's my struggle too. And there's there's some people right now that are messaging me like, hey, I'm, I just hit six months sober. Mm. Like, and it's entirely back to me kind of sharing my story that they're trying to quit and they're using me as one of those little accountability pieces inside of it. Yeah. And that's really cool. And many of them are saying, I'm not a Christian, but it's, you know, what, what, what worked for you? They're, they're asking me to, to kind of share. And I, you know, I even think through eight years of being youth pastor guy and mm. speaking at different kind of events and all the people at my church. And when we did events together, I, I mean, maybe mm. over all those years, 10,000 people I spoke to, most of those people only heard me once. And then, you know, maybe thousand, 2000 heard me pretty regularly. And you think I shared my story on my YouTube channel two times. And each time I did that, over 30,000 people watched that video. Mm-hmm. And that's, you start to think about that. Like, that's really profound. Like that, um, you know, uh, it's obviously the depth of when you're there every week is much deeper than um, the nature of being a YouTube channel. But in another sense, the, the, how wide my audience now um, to be able to share that and have people that will listen and having earned the right to be heard. It's, it's pretty cool. No, yeah, that's it's amazing. Like, like I said, um, uh, you you are definitely an inspiration to people, and and the fact that you're open with your story and open to a sense where it's very, very detailed, um, you, it's almost like a no holds bar kind of mentality with you. Uh, and we're kind of running out of time with the interview section, but I do have an important question to ask you. So, uh, briefly speaking, and in, in a few sentences, because you did kind of touch on it in the last question, but you know, uh, dropping off before we talk about movies and video games, uh, there are some people out there, and you've interacted with them on your YouTube channel, where they think that they can never redeem themselves, that they've they've gone off the deep end, they can never come back. But you uh, are very adamant to say that, no, I I've been three years sober, and three years ago in 2016, I was I was a wreck, like you said in this interview, and now you're you're in a better place. So for those who think that they're always going to be a screw up or quote unquote screw up or always going to be that alcoholic, how would you encourage these people that's never too late to be redeemed? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think to some of that just kind of does kind of go to go to the core Christian theology, which is mm-hmm. grace centric. And it's it's never been about me being awesome at its core. We all inherently mess up constantly. Yeah. And that's the central concept that, uh, you know, so, so many people get it so backwards, both people that don't go to church and people that do go to church and they make it the front and center's behavior, which is total opposite of the message of the gospel, um, which the, the behavior comes out of the life change, not the other way around. Yeah. And, and I, I think understanding at the core of it, that it's, it's, it's never been about, being good enough. It's mm-hmm. never been about you just having the willpower to fix it. It's always been about um, redemption. That's at the center of the gospel that um, we're saved by grace. And that's the the same grace that saves us is the same st- grace that empowers us for day-to-day living. And I, I, I just, and even if you're not coming from a churchy background, I mean, we're just simply not defined by our biggest mistake. Mm. We're not defined by the worst decision we ever made, even if that decision lasted a long time. You always have the choice today to to make the change and make the right decision. Mm. And there's always going to be people out there that will judge you based off your worst decisions, and that's on them. That's yeah. if they choose to be someone that sees the worst in people. And there's for being a, a society that claims to value tolerance at the at its core, mm. like it's the least gracious. Um, society imaginable. I mean, it's um, in, in movie space. It's just so many things right now of looking up 10 year old tweets and things like just these crazy stories that it's 
it's really easy in a society that pretends to value tolerance. Mm. But tolerance is just a cheap answer. Uh, something, it, tolerance is just a cheap version of grace that's, that's not valuable because it doesn't have any weight to it. Um, and grace means I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. Yeah. And sometimes that's – we, we, we you know, Amazing Grace is one of the most sung songs in human history. Mm-hmm. And we don't stop to think how amazing the concept of grace is until you've had a moment where you really feel you need it. Yeah. Um, and that's what – like for me, being pastor guy, you don't feel like you need grace because you inherent inside of that it's easy to have a lot of self-righteousness. And then when I find myself as hypocrite, drunk pastor Mm. with no reputation, suddenly you're like, all I'm living on is grace, is realizing this has never been about how good I behave. That is not what this is about. So anyway, there's a bunch of rambly thoughts in there. But I think the key thing is understanding that you're just it's never been about your worst mistake. Uh, cause we've all got a worst mistake and I, I don't want you to judge me based off my worst mistake. So I'm not going to judge you based off your worst mistake either. Um, there you go. No, it's great. I mean, uh, for anybody listening or anybody watching on YouTube, if you haven't already, uh, checked out, uh, Sean Chandler's, uh, discussions about, uh, his alcoholism, how he, um, was redeemed by grace. Uh, it, it's a, it's an amazing story and I've really connected with it a lot because, uh, a lot of our audience knows that I was also in youth ministry, and I just got a breaking edge. And uh, you know, Sean, just a just a thank you again. Like I, I talked with you off mm-hmm. camera. I've I shared with you my struggles, and uh, you've really given me a lot of uh, thoughts. You, you've given me a lot of um, encouragement in the past. So definitely, um, thank you for that. And you do it for anybody that approaches you. So I really thank you for that. So. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely check out his channel. Definitely check out those videos. But we want to go uh, transition into a uh, much more lighter tone. I'm trying to segue. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to segue. And we always do this on the podcast that I'm either in a really like on a sad news piece or really aggravating news piece. Like, like we never go into the talking points in a positive light. Yeah. <laughs> ever. <laughs> Huh. Oh, some some of this actually really appreciate what I can have talk like talk about stuff like this because even to what we already talked about it the transparency and wanting the the reality to be out there and um so much of what I talk about is just about the movies and yeah. with the energy and everything like it's like yeah here's but there's all this other stuff to me that I, I I want people to understand and I think when you understand the all the deeper stuff to me it even mm-hmm. kind of helps you understand how the way I, I watch movies I, I mean, even mm-hmm. um. Talking about movies, uh, um, you know, last month Doctor Sleep came out, and there's a mm-hmm. whole alcoholism, daddy issues runs throughout the whole thing. Yeah, and you don't really understand my review of that movie and why I uh, had preferred it over the original Shining, unless you understand my story. Your personal, in which case yeah. suddenly mm-hmm. that my why that movie resonated with me very heavily makes a ton of sense. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's... Anyway, sorry that was another rapper trail about myself. Oh no, no problem. Um... But yeah, let's uh, in, in, in speaking about movies and speaking about those narratives, actually, let's just uh, jump into it. Uh, let's just go into our final segment. Talkie time. Every single week here on the Games and Groceries channel, we like to do a talking point section, whether it be about uh, female gamers or game preservation. We like to come here and just talk about uh, what's happening in the games industry and just you know have a solid discussion about it. But since we have a movie YouTuber here with us, Mr. Sean Chandler here, uh, we want to uh, talk about movies versus video games in the terms of narratives. So uh, we always start these discussions by defining the discussion. So we're all on the same page here. So I think the very first thing we should talk about is uh, let's define what a narrative does for a movie or for a video game. So, Sean, take it away. What, what does a narrative do for both of them? Um, I mean, it's the thread that runs throughout that gives meaning to whatever else is happening. Yeah. So what gives meaning to the humor, the comedy or the action or whatever it is, you care about it because there's this narrative, this journey that the characters are on mm. that gives the action inside of it, the scenarios, the tension, the drama, meaning because you care about that 
person. There's tension. It's funny to sit in a scenario or you you care about how it'll play out. It has emotional weight and stakes because the narrative exists mm -hmm. that ties it to something. Um, you know, it's that difference between if you can go on YouTube now and look up clips from all kinds of movies. And yeah. that's not nearly as satisfying as watching the movie. Like sometimes you just want to rewatch that clip. But like if you watch Endgame, mm -hmm. the third act is so powerful if you watch the whole journey leading up to it. If you just watch the clip, it's a pretty cool little shot or a bunch of really cool shots. Mm -hmm. But it's that narrative that you go on this very long journey with them to try and defeat Thanos. And then when they have all these iconic shots, it's so powerful because the narrative that it's attached to, and that same principle applies to, to you know, a good game to where you, you care because you're on this journey with the character, with whatever's happening along with them. Um, and I, I think that's the thing. It's the thread that runs through that gives meaning, value, yes. emotion to everything. And, and I think that that hits it right in the head right there, and especially for video games. If there's no sort of narrative, then why am I going from point A to point B? Why am I doing these side missions? Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? Like it, it needs to have a good solid narrative. Otherwise, why am I doing these actions? Yeah. Uh, and, and Liz, I think you feel the same way. Right? Yeah, I agree. I was just thinking, like, as you guys were, like, describing it, it sounds like it's almost like the narrative, like, the is, like, the plot's little helper. Okay. You know? Well, like... Like, it helps. I think the narrative and the plot are the same thing. If Am I wrong? I don't know. It kind of depends on which definition you look yeah. at. Yeah. There's story, narrative, plot, and they're kind of the same. Well, they all, yeah, yeah they're, like they're cousins. Exactly like, which one they are. I just imagine, like, the plot is, like, the big idea. Like, this is what we want to accomplish. And then right. the okay, okay. I see like, what you're all saying. right, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying there. It, it, and it goes into what Sean Chandler says. It's like, uh, I'm just going to call you Sean Chandler for the rest of this. <laughs> Very professional. Sean. Uh, uh, if you could call me the Sean Chandler. The Sean Chandler. <laughs> it's like what the <laughs> Sean Chandler said. It's the thread that kind of picks up the plot. And and, and that's what it all is. It's, it's even just watching a movie. I still haven't sat down and watched um, The Irishman. Is, is yeah. that what it's called? Yeah, that Be looks really good. Because yeah. it's so long. But I did watch a review on it, and it sounds like the narrative it does push you forward because it is a three-and-a-half-hour film. It, the narrative is, why am I watching this mm -hmm. three-and-a-half hour? It, it, it's what's helping you do the why. Yeah. 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 So, well, And that's like, so even speaking of The Irishman, yeah. uh, it's one that... There's so many, so much plot and so many threads at the beginning that it took me a little bit to kind of latch on to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once you got about halfway through it and you I was got all the characters and they got a little bit more focused and the, the plot was clear, mm -hmm. the, the narrative was clear. When it got to that point in time, like I was really invested. But when I was trying to figure out what is this ride that I'm on? What is the central narrative what am i supposed to be feeling towards these people yeah. i felt disconnected until i latched onto that narrative mm. and as soon as that happened though i was totally on board for the last uh hour and a half of the movie yeah, or in the yeah. case of that movie the last two and a half hours of the movie because it goes on forever yeah well that's just it i i think that um in movies like if you have a really long movie like there has to be some sort of purpose or else you get drained out mm -hmm. especially with um uh, with it chapter two, like there's a middle section where it's just, yeah. it's it's a lot of nothing. But uh, but it's cir circular, like yeah. it's the same yeah. thing happens over literally over. six times in a row. Legitimately, yeah. the same exact thing happens because it's the same cycle. Person goes to place in city, mm -hmm. uh, remembers the past, fights Pennywise, and then that yeah. happens to yeah. all six people. And it's like it's just not going anywhere. It's just like okay, we just did this. Yeah. So. Let me get your opinion on this because um, you yourself on your channel, you say you're not too much of a gamer. I, game. Do. I <laughs> do. You say you're uh, not too much of a gamer, but you have had experience with uh, playing some games. You you yeah. just recently reviewed uh, Star Wars Jedi or Jedi Fallen Order, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, in our experience here, how do you think the difference is between narratives of movies is for video games? Because uh, I forget who said it, but it was an author. Uh, who wrote for video games uh, later on in life where she was an author of a book and an author of a book is very linear. Like there, there's one set of story and it goes on until the end. The same kind of thing with a movie, but a video game 
is more branching off. Like these options go here. It depends on the interaction between the player. Uh, it's a different kind of narrative presentation. Um, but but what would you say, the Sean Chandler uh, of movies <laughs> versus video games? Well, I think when you're, there's a number of different ways to take it. It's, I mean, part of it's difficult to talk about video game narratives. Yeah. Since there's obviously 40, 45 years of video games out there with very different amounts of story. Pong yeah. had a very thin narrative. And then other <laughs> yeah. ones have these open sandbox games where it can go on all these different paths. But yeah. I, I mean, I think part of it is a movie is a self-contained story that's mm. intended to be consumed in a single sitting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like the way it's supposed to work. And that's somewhat why people are like the, the Irishman's too long. I mean, it's three and a half hours and it's not in theaters. It's not like, like going to the escape of the theater. It's I'm at my house yeah. where kids, dogs, dinner, all kinds of things interrupt mm -hmm. that. And so it, 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 it's a tricky way to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's one key piece is that, it's intended to be one sitting as opposed to a game, which is going to be a, a passage of time, especially modern games. It's going to yeah. take you a week to beat the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're pushing hard to beat it, it's going to take you a week. And yeah. it's assumed that you're consuming it in kind of like hour chunks probably. Yeah. or the, um, it, It's designed to have different levels to it that there's this piece right here, amount of story with action that you consume, and then the next piece of action, mm -hmm. which in certain ways is a little bit more like a narrative, which has or a, a book, a novel, mm -hmm. which has chapters, chapters to it. Which in, once yeah. again, the, a book is not meant to be consumed in a single sitting. It's intended, here's this little block you can consume, and here's another block you can consume. And I assume you're reading about 30 minutes you know, per day or whatever it, it looks like. And so I think that's one of the things that kind yeah. of changes the nature of it is that it's meant to be broken up into these little blocks that are a certain amount of time mm -hmm. that you feel like the story progressed. And, uh, you know, I got to battle a bunch of stormtroopers or orcs or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so it has the action plus this piece of story moved forward and you can remember it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Liz, uh, how would you say to that? I agree pretty much with everything he said. Because um, you read more than I do. That's saying a lot because I don't read a lot. <laughs> I'm lucky if I make it through a book in a year. Yeah. With the amount of time I have. But Well, you read more uh, novels than I do. I Yeah, you, you're more a comic book guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. um, but yeah, I do. I would relate a book and a video game narrative more similarly because it's meant to be consumed in chunks of time. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the mood, like between movies and video games, the, a big difference is the fact that it's almost like video games, like narrative video games, not only can they go in different directions because like you have to write every direction you can go in. Cause most narrative games, it's mm -hmm. all right. You choose how this goes. So right. You have to write a story for every direction a lot like Life is Strange. Yeah, like yeah. Life is Strange. And like other ones we played, which I can't think of because I'm bad at thinking on my toes. Yeah. But it's like that. And then also... Until Dawn. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to movies and video games, video games are almost like you're writing like 10 mini movies. Hmm. Okay. In certain, in certain ones. In I certain mean, ones, but... Like certain yeah. ones when they have chapters it, it's literally is five little movies yeah like think of life is strange each each episode is between an hour and a half and three hours uh sean have you ever played uh life is strange yet mm -mm. yeah it's uh no. it's definitely uh it's it's an episodic um we we talk about it a lot on the channel yeah, in fact yeah. um that's where we get most of our listens from is life is strange <laughs> episodes but it's a it's an episodic kind of journey where uh each uh different level you can say is actually given to you um, on a monthly basis. So you buy the whole season, but then you can play one episode and then uh, wait a couple months and then the next episode comes out. And so it's kind of fed to you in that kind of way. And you kind of affect the story with your choices. So it kind of breaks itself like what yeah. you're saying. You're making different kinds of movies. Yeah. It, it, it's in that branching. So I think it takes a strong... Oh, oh, I wouldn't say a stronger mind, but it definitely takes a lot more focus and 
strength, mental strength to write a video game as opposed to a movie or a book. Yeah. No, I can agree to that. I mean, um, in, in developing a video game, it's 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 a lot more difficult because yeah. you're you're working with a lot of different, uh, yeah, a lot of different technologies, and it's just really time consuming. But, uh, but I've, I've thought about that of like some of these like uh, role playing games, yeah, where you go into yeah. a city and there's thirty people there that you can have a conversation with, and then there's thirty cities in the game, and you go. Well, well, that just adds up real quick. And um, someone had to write yeah. all of that, these different ways and different mm-hmm. characters. And, um, you know, obviously just in that the way that you have to construct a narrative and a story is uh, when you're thinking about it, that the player controls how it unfolds. Yeah. yeah. And so that radically changes the formula of everything when you don't get to dictate when it happens, how it happens, where that's what, you know, the whole idea of a director is they decide exactly mm-hmm. how you would, you experience the story from beginning to end. Yeah. Whereas with a game, the whole thing, the game determines it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it really depends on the player's interaction. I forget what game it was, but very, very recently there were some complaints about why can't we make this decision? And the ve- developers came out and said, Listen, we can't think of every single situation that you're yeah. going to possibly do. I'm sorry it's not there, but we can't read 100,000 people's minds of yeah. what they're going to do. Um, but but speaking on the differences between movies and video games, uh, a recent game just came out, Jedi Fallen Order. In fact, yes. right before we started filming this, I just beat it. Uh, yeah. I, I finally... I, I was on the middling level, but I just wanted to know the story. So I just switched it to easy mode and I just wanted to know the end. So I was just, I was so invested in the story. I was like, listen, I'm just mowing these people down and I just want to get to the end. Uh, but without any spoilers, uh, Sean, you did a review on this of Jedi Fallen Order. In fact, I'll, I'll link it up here if anybody wants to watch it. Um, definitely watch it, by the way. Sean, uh, you, you reviewed it and you had some problems with the gameplay where it, it kind of got in the way of the storytelling of Star Wars. And, and the issue with Star Wars, not the issue, but what makes Star Wars magical is the stories, the narrative. It is a mm-hmm. space opera. It is meant for storytelling. Whereas I feel like Jedi Fallen Order puts gameplay over story at times. Uh, yeah. the, the third act definitely was a Star it's, Wars mm-hmm. uh, story, but the first two acts definitely put gameplay over story so yeah. i want to i want to get your take on it because you're a big star wars fan huge star wars fan so what was your take on on, on all of that where it put gameplay over story yeah I, I, I for me it's some of it could be you know it's pushing for a deadline to make do the review at a certain point in time some yeah. of it could be i've got two kids that wanted to play along. And so they kept trying to grab the remote and they would join in sometimes. And it was like, you guys are terrible at this and you're don't, please don't go down. The- oh, you did go down that hill. <laughs> Why did you do that? Uh, so, I mean, there's some of those frustrations that yeah. uh, uh, kind of were pushing it, but like for me kind of going through it, um, there'd be times you go to this planet or I mean, it's like, there's this whole section where it's like, go to this planet, look for this item. Mm-hmm. And then it takes you an hour to get to the item yeah. And so you're just going through like traversing and sliding down hills and just doing all this stuff. And then you get there and then it's like, you have found the item. Get back to your ship. Yeah. You're like, oh, OK, awesome. Now we can move on to the next thing. And it takes you another hour to get back to your mm-hmm. ship. Yeah. And so then it's like you have this two hour little journey where it's like, OK, I, I have the thing, mm-hmm. but I don't really feel like the story progressed. There wasn't a big story thing. It was just me, um, you know, climbing up crawling around, walking around. And so it was all discovery traverse gameplay Mm -hmm. and not feeling like I was connected to that narrative. And that was the thing for me where I just like, I just want to get off this planet. I I just want to get to something where I feel like I'm in the story. And some Mm -hmm. of the planets Mm -hmm. that happen, sometimes you'd be going through there and then the evil force lady, uh, uh, inquisitor lady would show up and you'd be like, Oh, okay. We're learning something. Okay. I feel like I'm in the plot now because she's here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing is that it wasn't, there were sections where you felt the person you're trying to overcome Mm -hmm. and 
And that's where you feel narrative because the whole thing is about we are trying to beat her to this thing. But when I just go to some planet and I'm just walking around for two hours, lost and sliding down hills, it just feels like I'm playing traverse game with a lightsaber. Yeah, no. Uh, and, and that's the thing is that hot take that you're going to hear on this channel after I've beaten it and after I've played through it. And I, and I had kind of the same issues as you did where – I, I think that a lot of people who enjoy Dark Souls or Bloodborne or uh, any of those kinds of games very much enjoyed this, where they enjoy gameplay over story. Hot take for me, I think that Force Unleashed handled the story better than Jedi Fallen Order. I, I Now, did you ever play uh, Force Unleashed? Uh, I never played through it, no. I, I played, like, demo, and I, I have played it. I have not played through it. Yeah, if you... Uh, if you play through it, I think that it handles the gameplay and the story. It balances it very well. And in my in my opinion, not going to say it's objective, but I think that Force Unleashed handled that narrative so much better. I wouldn't give Jedi Fallen Order, you know, a 10 out of 10 like a lot of people are giving it. But I think it, I think it had a good story. I think it connected to the Star Wars universe very well once you got to the end of it. Not spoiling anything right right here, but and that's the thing about Star Wars. It needs to be story heavy because that's the story of Star Wars. It's based on, um, you know, no, the novels, the comic books, the movies, the the shows, Star Wars Rebels, Star Wars Clone Wars. It's all based. The, these all kind of work because Star Wars is uh, a medium for narratives. And I and I think that video games can get in the way of a narrative because it wants to have. Uh, like what you said, Sean, is uh, snowboarding or wall climbing yeah. in, mm -hmm. in Star I, Wars. I had so many. I That was a, actually a really frustrating comment section for me because, um, you know, I get you know all bogged down, go to these planets, and it's like, all right, I'm climbing another wall. I'm snowboarding down another slope or mudsliding and giant, trying to jump over another cave. And yeah. it just didn't feel like Star Wars when I was doing all this stuff. And it's like, oh, look, a Venus five trap ate me. And then now there's a bugs coming after me. Yeah. And so I said it didn't feel Star Warsy. And people were like, um, actually, in season four of the Clone Wars, episode number 13, they like, yeah. like it, it, if you don't know what I'm if you if it worked for you, I don't want to steal that from you. My right. purpose is not to convince you to like it less. Mm -hmm. My point is. I wish I liked it more. Here's why I didn't. And yeah. I had yeah. people arguing with me like, um, yes, like mudsliding is very Star Warsy. Like yeah. someone was arguing that point was they're like, what 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 are you arguing right now? No, yeah. There's you there's no possible way that you could say I say Star Wars to you, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, like someone like sliding down a hill of mud or snow. Yeah. Like, like no one has ever th had that thought. And right. this person yeah. was arguing the point with me and I was weird. It was really weird. But yeah. you know, for me, it's just, I, I just didn't feel like I was in star Wars when I, I was spending like, so much time on these puzzles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I felt more like I was playing uncharted or dark souls yeah. or I, I felt like I was playing other video games, but I wasn't playing star Wars. And yeah, I know mm -hmm. Liz, you didn't even play Jedi nope. Fallen or I don't recommend it for you because I don't think you would enjoy it too much. Well, that stinks. I wanted to play it. I mean, you can play it. I'm not stopping you. <laughs> but I'm just saying is that I felt more, you know, I was immersed in other video games yeah. I played versus something like Force Unleashed versus something like KOTOR where it, it feels like I'm in the Star Wars universe yeah. here. Yeah. But uh, now I want to go, kind of go into something a little bit differently because, uh, Sean, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Um, but it, I'm starting to notice that a lot of Hollywood actors are actually getting involved in gaming. Like they're, they're actually being involved in the game's narrative to make it more of a movie like experience, uh, such as Christopher judge, who was in God of war. Christopher judge, of course, was in, um, was he in Battlestar Galactica? I believe I'm losing it. I think it's Stargates. Um, now I, now I'm confused. Christ yeah. Christopher judge. He was, um, he was in Stargates. Now, now I'm sorry, Lizzie, because I put it, should have put it in my notes. But he was in God of War. Um, Norman Reedus is now. In, oh, you're looking yes, at Stargate. Yes, yes, sorry, got Stargate it. is the answer. Yeah, a uh, little trivia uh, for you is that Christopher Judge, when he was reading the uh, the monologues for God of War, when he was playing Kratos in in God of War, 
he actually did not believe he was in a video game because how well written yeah. like his lines were. He thought this was a straight up movie, like an animated movie. But, you know, he's in that Norman Reedus, of course, in Death Stranding and now Cameron uh, Monaghan in Jedi Fallen Order. Uh, do we see that the near future, five, ten years from now, that we're going to see even more Hollywood actors, if not exclusively Hollywood actors being the narratives of video games? Like, what do we think about that? Uh, I would think so. I mean, I, I think that that's entirely the direction that everything is moving towards. That all kind of the, the past boundaries of there's movies and there's TV actors and all that stuff is kind of going away as you have the democratization, democratization of, yeah. of um, um, or the lubies of entertainment. We get to pick what we want mm -hmm. and we're not picky. We don't think of no consumers don't see it that way. You have prestige television and we're having prestige video games now. And so then it's about is this a great product that they're putting a lot of money into and you're seeing some of the um i mean i haven't even looked into too much of it but like i don't remember, i don't remember the, which person it was but uh, you know on some of these games they're bringing in like a-list screenwriters to yeah. work on the plots for some of these video games and so it only makes sense that you would start to see some of the, the conversion on stuff like that so for me the the beginning of this was um and i don't know if this is in the game of video gaming the uh the landmark or anything like that, but yeah. Oh, wing commander three. Yeah. Oh when yeah. I was, so I, I played wing commander two, mm -hmm. um, whenever it came out and then they announced we're doing a, a third one and we're going to mm -hmm. have actors in it. Yeah. Mark Hamill, yeah. Luke Skywalker is going to be, uh, was it Blair? Is the, mm -hmm. the character? I don't remember. Josh Lucas is in it. Mark DeCoscos. They so became the iron chef, but he also started some martial arts movies. I mean, it had all these people and it was like, there's actors and they're in a video game and they're, they're really going for it. And um, that was the first one for me. And I imagine like budget wise, you just very few do it at the time. I was even technologically speaking, it was a game that was very advanced. And I just think that we're now at that point in time that there's video games are so mainstream yeah. that we have enough generations of past to where adults play video games. That's not a weird thing. anymore. that's just like, well, I would not play video games. I'm not a weirdo. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, yeah. And you get to a certain point in time that the, all the stigma attached to video games is gone. And then the A-list actors of today, they're all people that, you know, they, they see that sign behind you and they know that that's the Konami code. Like the, the actor, A-list oh, actors yeah. today know that they're, they're my age. And, and so they can interpret that. And that's the era that we are in right now, in which case, they perceive of video games differently than even someone, you know, that's 55 right now, their perception of video games. I think that changes the whole formula, all of the equation of, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you just throw a name out there, like, you know, if, if Chris Pratt grew up playing video games, he remembers when Mark Hamill showed up in Wing Commander. Yeah. And now he thinks how cool that is. Like, that is just a fake example. I don't have any ties to reality. <laughs> yeah. But, like, he has that thought mm -hmm. in his head. Yeah. That like, oh, I could do that too. That'd be really cool. Yeah. And I, I just think you're just going to see um, a lot more of that because it is just so mainstream now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Liz, what do, you, what do you think of this? I agree because, and we've talked about it on the podcast before, how video games is slowly making the climb to becoming a medium just like movies. Yeah. You know, it's becoming more mainstream. It's more popular. And I think as it gets there, you're going to see more actors because mm -hmm. I think not only are the developers of video games thinking, we're big enough now. I think we can take, I think we can get this big actor. Yeah. And vice versa. The actors like, okay. Like they don't think a video game is like, oh, that's like, that's a stupid gig. I'm not going to do a video game. They're yeah. seeing it as a real thing now mm -hmm. a real gig yeah because it, it's been around for a, for a good while that you'll mm -hmm. see hollywood actors in games like like you had liam neeson in fallout 3 yeah uh you you had also mark hamill also in uh Bat the batman games uh the arkham asylum games as joker mm -hmm. as he was the joker in the animated series mm -hmm. as well uh so you you had like little trickles there and it was kind of special but now you're seeing more uh of a norm that mm -hmm. Hollywood actors are in it. Like you're starting to see even that. like, I mean, Keanu Reeves showing and, up was, yeah. it, is yes. that, was that E3? Was it or yeah, whatever E3. it was in June where like he is on stage. Yeah. Like, he's making the announcement. It's not just, he recorded something over the phone and then it was like, all right, that was, I'm done with that. 
he's doing the press tour for yeah. it. Yeah. Like all in the way actors do for big movies they're starring in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and even uh, E3 next year, they're starting to say that it's going to be more of a celebrity kind of event. Um, and now, you know, the mainstream is really coming in where uh, the Game Awards are going to be happening next next Thursday, uh, December 12th. Uh, or as you're listening to this, this Thursday, actually. Uh, where Green Day and churches are going to be performing, like these these mainstream actual people, like it, video games are starting to you know take more press. They're being starting taken. to be noticed and being taken yeah. more seriously. Mm-hmm. Even to the point where Hideo Kojima is working with um, you know a list actors, and now he's yeah. going to be working on movies pretty soon. Um, but if you know anything about Hideo Kojima, those movies are going to be five hours long. So yeah, probably good luck with that. But, you know, and I and I think in, a, in the next few years, we're going to see that it's going to be the norm that if a big AAA game is going to have uh, a narrative, it's going to have a Hollywood actor into it mm-hmm. at, in some form or factor. Um, but since we're running out of time here, and, and like I said, Sean, I don't want to keep you uh, too, uh, you know, too late. Uh, I'm just going to skip to my to my last point here. And uh, it really is becoming the norm of multiplayer games. And a lot of analysts are saying that because multiplayer games are on the rise, uh, some narratives are, or some analysts are saying that narrative based games are on the, on on the down low. They're they're starting to become uh, less noticed that they're going to get less press, but more and more. So I think people are just in it for narratives. That's just how the human mind works. We are in it for narratives. In fact, um, when we talked about Christianity, uh, just a few moments ago, I mean, people asked Jesus, why do you speak in narratives? Why do you speak in these? Um, uh, I lost the word for it. Why, why do you speak in these uh, sort parables? of parables? Parables. Thank you, everybody. Good job, youth pastor. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, uh, but why do you speak in parables? And, you know, Jesus' uh, response was like, this is how you understand the kingdom of God, if I explain it another way. Because the human mind conceives things through parables, through yeah. narratives. So, for someone to say that narrative based games, single player games are on the decrease, I, I think that's kind of, you know, I, I think that's kind of a lie to say that, that people don't want narratives. I hope they're lying because I hate multiplayer games. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it's like, um, but I think that's why movies still exist too, is because yeah. we want to know more narratives. Um, uh, Sean, what do you think about that? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a, uh... It's a misreading of even kind of people. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, the, it's someone that maybe they themselves like the just visceral experience. I don't know visceral might be the overstate the experience, but, yeah. um, you know, they like just death matches or whatever. Like they just like to be there present and like, yeah, I'm just running around mowing people down. Some people like that. Like that's, yeah. that's a specific thing that you can enjoy. There's no narrative to it. It's just the competition. It's yeah. uh, sport. In video game fashion. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that people enjoy. It It's a sport. It's a competition. I want to win the Fortnite world of things. Yeah. And then there's people that want to have a journey, that narrative. Yeah. And those are – there. it's the same medium, video mm-hmm. games, mm-hmm. but it's kind of two different ways to experience it. Yeah. And anyone that thinks that like narrative – like narrative is going to go away because multiplayer is getting so good, you're, you're missing out on – half of what people draw people to video games which it's this whole other thing and that's always been there that even you know back 30 years ago they were still doing final fantasy and finding a way to do narrative stuff even when the technology wasn't nearly as advanced they were still doing story-based games at the time and um they've always looked found ways to do that because some people want that and some people just want to blow away zombies and demons and stuff like um, that but both of those are always there yeah, no, I I think that's true. Is that, um, and I like and I like what you said. It kind of demeans the human mind where only people yeah. want to compete. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and and I think they're only saying that because they want to see multiplayer sales on the rise because that's where you get the most monetization. That's where you get uh the most amount of continuous playthrough. Uh, a, a lot of people are saying that you know people who make single player games they're going to lose money because you you play it you beat it you you put it down you don't the, the constant revenue there but i think that's a, a kind of a lie to say that like you don't make money off of that because there's mm-hmm. been 
a number of successful single player games. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, Wait, and he, they even talk about the uh, uh, kind of even the mainstreaming of video games. Yeah. And uh, because a game costs seventy dollars, these big yeah. hit games have. Um, I hope they don't cost seventy dollars soon. <laughs> or however, how, whatever they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, whenever a new game comes out, they'll have like a five hundred million dollar launch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like this enormous amount of yeah. money mm-hmm. that where you know uh, uh, they don't. It's not normally tracked the way that movies are, where it's like so specifically we look at box office every weekend. They don't normally do that with movie or with video game sales, but they have occasionally run these articles where it's like this is so much more of a dominant part of the the um, uh, um, economy than we're giving it credit for. Like these are – if any movie did the numbers of the latest Call of Duty or whatever, they would be going bananas yeah. because it's just so much money. And so when people say this stuff, it's like you're I, – I get why you, it's an easy revenue stream that's like – I can see why if you're the, the business person yeah. is thinking how do we get monthly revenue. Right. Mm-hmm. That's sm- very smart business and so you're always wanting to find a way to do that. But there's also something really powerful about getting my 60 bucks whenever your game first comes out. If you yeah. put out a great game that I'm yeah. invested in. Um, and, and so I think it's uh, – on a business, on a human experience level, both sides are always there's always demand for both of those things, and even on a business side, I think that it's well-rounded businesses mm. know how to look at all the revenue streams and a, a holistically think about all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I I wholeheartedly agree, and and I think that's a good way to uh, kind of end our conversation. Is that like always understand that you want a good narrative no matter what and. And I like what you say that video games will boost the economy, but it, it, it needs to respect through the mainstream as well. Yeah. Uh, movies, of course, are already respected in the mainstream. But when we talk about video games, it still has some steps to take yeah. to get that kind of respect there. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think we can uh, all agree that um, human minds, they desire a narrative. They, they desire competition. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, not all. You know, not Quakers, but uh, <laughs> but you know, a lot of people do desire that sort of narrative. So mm-hmm. I think we can end that there because uh, Sean, I'm sure, um, I'm sure you would like to go to sleep. You know, uh, I, I, I don't I, sleep. I, you don't I, sleep. I run on just run on Red Bull. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> um, but I want to keep you too. Um, you're you're a busy man. You um, th- that that's an understatement because uh, the 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 amount of if you haven't checked out Sean's channel just yet, uh, the amount of of I don't want to say effort, you know, because, you know, I feel like that's the meaning. But the, the amount of work and hustle that you put into your channel that that you get this kind of um, really great production out of your channel uh, to say that you're a busy man is an understatement because it, it really shows with your work ethic. So that's why I'm going to say that I'm not going to keep you too long. As I ramble on, especially okay, this week, talking. my uh, wife is out of town, so I'm playing single dad this Ooh. week. So that's even the time I picked for when we had to record this. It was just like put the kids to bed, walked upstairs, and said, "All right, I'm here." Yeah, yeah. right. And, uh, and you have a newborn, uh, correct? Uh, she's over a year now. Okay, but, yeah. So she's not. She's out of newborn phase, but still uh, unable to communicate. She just yeah. screams and makes noises, and it's yeah, just talk. Tell me what you want. <laughs> We'd both be happier if you just figured out this talking thing. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. Well, Sean, uh, thank you again for coming on to this episode to talk about uh, narrative games. And uh, before we let off, um, is there anything you want to plug? Is there any new projects that, that are coming down the way that you want to really get hyped for? Uh, we're rolling out the red carpet for you. All right. Yeah. So the big thing for me is next month in January, I'm looking to watch my own podcast. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm kind of very much in the development phase, talking with a graphic designer to get some graphics for it and working to book some interviews and trying to do some on my main channel. I normally like review movies and or rank franchises. And so this one's trying to kind of expand what I talk about and have an element to it. That is the talking about the movie news Mm -hmm. or whatever's going on in the space of movies that people are talking about. Yeah. That's what I want to talk about. And then the other part to it is kind of have more collaborations, join people on it. So it has 
act, not just me monologuing about movies, but talking with people about movies and then also trying to have a element to it where I, where I interview people. And um, I've got to actually some, potentially some really cool stuff happening with it, that some partnerships and someone that uh, I, I have an audience and he has amazing connections so that it could be some hmm. very cool stuff hmm. in 2020. That's the thing I'm very excited for. Or you can just find me on the YouTube and look up Sean Chandler. You either find a uh, NFL player or yeah. a guy that looks like me and talks about movies. Yeah. There it's you the go. one that no. looks like me talks yeah. about movies. If you uh, can't already tell, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you'll see his picture right here. So just, uh, you know, find a little picture right there. <laughs> uh, but again, Sean, thank you for coming on, for talking about uh, video games with us. Uh, you can, of course, follow the podcast here on Twitter at Gaming Groceries or follow us on Instagram, Games and Groceries, all one word. And you can follow us on Facebook. You know, search for Games and Groceries on Facebook. Uh, all right. With all that said and done, we thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope to have you back next week. Y'all have a good week. Bye.